And this is brought to you by the IMI Big Data for Better Outcomes program, which I'd like to tell you a little bit more about. The IMI Big Data for Better Outcomes program aims to improve health outcomes in healthcare systems in Europe by maximizing the potential of patient data. It's composed of a number of disease-specific and enabling projects. The disease-specific projects include projects on Alzheimer's disease, cardiovascular disease, hematological malignancies, and prostate cancer. And the enabling projects include the European Health Data and Evidence Network and the Coordination and Support Action Project called DOIT. And this webinar is brought to you by the DOIT project, where, along with Semmelweis University, I lead the work on communications and outreach. If you want some more information about the BD4BO initiative, please visit www.bd4bo.eu. And now I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce my guests. Um, to begin with, we have Rafal Switzewski. Apologies, Rafal, if I've mispronounced that. Um, so, Rafael has been involved in uh, patient advocacy for over 10 years as both a scientist and as a cancer survivor. He currently represents the European Cancer Patient Coalition uh, in the European Medicines Agency and has been involved in various projects including Adaptive Pathways, Advance and Web Radar. Rafael also present, represents patients' interest in the European Union's clinical trial portal and database of stakeholder groups created within the EMA to construct new systems for implementing European regulations on clinical trials and clinical data. Welcome, Rafael. Next, I'd like to introduce um, a ter Dario Pisto. <laughs> Welcome, Dario. Um, and uh, Dr. Dario joins us from, uh, from, from Estonia, where at the moment she is a board member at the North Estonia Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Dario has previously worked for the, uh, for the for the Unit Health and Wellbeing in DG Communications Network Content and Technology at the European Commission. Her main responsibilities uh, are related to the coordination of the implementation of the eHealth Action Plan 2012 to 2020, uh, as well as the overall coordination of the policy group uh, in the unit. Um, in 2014, she was also the EU Fellow in the University of South Cal Southern California in the USA, where her research focus was on the obstacles which hindered the introduction of e-health and in healthcare systems. Welcome, Dario. Um, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Dorian Marsic. Uh, Dorian is a former Slovenian Minister of Health and uh, is also uh, a practicing physician as well. Dorian was the head of the intensive therapy unit at Isola General Hospital and went on to assume the position of medical director. And during this time, he was also appointed the state of sec uh, uh, the secretary at the Ministry of Health uh, at the Republic of Slovenia and reappointed to the same position in 2004. Prior to his nomination for Minister of Health, he was an advisor to the Director General of the Health Insurance Institute of the Republic of Slovenia and engaged in a clinic and as, as a specialist in cardiology. Welcome, Dorian. And lastly, I'd like to introduce Miklos, who is also our host for today. Um, Miklos is the Director of Health Service uh, at the Health Services Management Training Centre uh, at the University of Semmelweis and is also, as I mentioned, a, a co-lead on this uh, initiative. Um, he's a Hungarian medical doctor, academic and politician, a former Minister of State for Health of Hungary, and the Director of the Health Services Management Training Centre and a nominated candidate by the Hungarian government for the upcoming general director position at the WHO in the past. Okay. Um, so with that, I'd like to begin by taking in turn um, some views from each uh, of our participants. And we'll start with Rafael, if you can give uh, a patient perspective on, the, on, on this topic, please. Yes, thank you very much for having me here. It, was, it is my great pleasure to represent patients, pers patients here and present to you patients' perspective on Profane legacy process for data-driven decision making. Uh, patients' needs are usually focused on a few main points: diagnosis, treatment, rehabilitation, involvement, education, prevention, and partnerships. The range of these needs is uh, dictated by new technologies development, which can be divided into two basic areas, standard area with health services, public health and research, and expanded areas of health technologies, environmental, life and social economic, and also behavioral and social. 
such a relation between patients' needs and uh, new technology development is quite natural, but we have a problem here in the center in Eastern European country because uh, the first area, standard area, is very problematic if it exists in our Central and Eastern European countries. Of course, there are still a few exceptions which could be uh, treated as uh, good practices. And uh, next, please. This area of uh, expanded area is very neglected in this uh, our countries, Central and European Eastern countries. To minimize uh, the difference between new technological development in uh, Central and uh, Eastern European countries and Western Europe, uh, I believe in the patient's perspective, we should put some main points. First of all, a patient's rights uh, should be at the first place while implementing any of new technologies in healthcare. Uh, the second point is uh, less policy making in our country, but, uh, countries, but more actions. The <clears throat> small step strategy development and implementation instead of entire healthcare system changes. The next uh, thing that we need very much is transparency. Good elaborated anti-fraud policies Codes of conduct, simplification of procedures, but we have to remember that disclosure, which is uh, more and more uh, useful in our country, user in our country, is not necessarily equivalent to transparency. The next point is uh, there is no need, also from my patient's perspective, uh, to invent the wheel once again, but we are in the big need to implement innovations and best practices already elaborated, also within European projects. But this implementation uh, must take place according to schemes adequate to Central and Eastern European countries. Uh, we need also more and more education and development of public-private partnerships, especially with local working at national level, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, such partnerships, uh, creation of such public partnerships can be only for patients' benefit, but it's uh, very often regarded as something wrong by, in our uh, countries. The next point is about data management. We need clear reg regulation on data management and responsibilities. It's usually connected to five times W, what, what kind of data we need, why, why those data need to be collected, who is responsible for processing of this data, where the data uh, are used, uh, or are they for the publication or uh, for any other purposes, and when the data are needed. We need also to focus on development of collaborative networks in uh, Central and Eastern European countries, including cross-border healthcare mechanisms. And the last but uh, not least point is that uh, bureaucracy in our countries is not a challenge itself. A challenge is to avoid the bureaucracy, and this is the main field for patients' in involvement uh, currently, I observe, instead of other actions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rafael, and uh, we'll move on to some of those points later when we move into a discussion. But next area, linking the, that patient perspective, if you can link that to us from a systemic perspective and what you found through your experience in, in Estonia, if you can give us that perspective, please, that would be most welcome. Thank you very much. First of all, for the invitation to participate and to share my experience and also to listen to other people's experience. and. Uh, uh, understanding what are the problems across the table and across Europe. I believe that from my introduction, uh, everybody can say that there was much longer history of working at the European Union level than working actually in a hospital, which is only from April this year. <laughs> but that only demonstrates that um, quite a lot of these issues that we have recognized uh, uh, from many member states in real world are the problems of a single hospital as well. 
I work now in the North Estonia Medical Center, which is the biggest hospital in Estonia of um, uh, 1.3 million people, uh, citizens in Estonia. It is, of course, not big. However, uh, for our SAMS, with almost half a million visits of different kind to our hospital per year, it is quite a lot of information that we collect. Mm -hmm. The question remains, what do we do with all this information that we collect? Uh, we have quite advanced digital platforms for many uh, purposes. Uh, nationwide, such as e-prescription, for example, or the patient portal where citizens can have an access to their own health data uh, and where they can see the progress. Uh, but we also have some local developments in our hospitals, such as local electronic health record or the uh, form of uh, monitoring the patient progress from a distance, not necessarily at the bedside, called e-patient. We have good uh, laboratory information system, radiology information system, pathology information system. They all function uh, perfectly fine within our hospital. It becomes problematic besides this e-prescription and patient portal, what I said, and also what we have countrywide is the uh, picture archive all images and their cardiograms where can be stored and every doctor in Estonia working in a hospital or outpatient clinic can have an access. Otherwise, this information is not very well shared, it cannot be put together and it is difficult to make a database that would benefit for these 1.3 million. So we are in principle working towards that. Uh, there is the good intentions in place. But for that, of course, we have to agree on what is that we collect, uh, how do we collect it, uh, where do we store it, and of course it comes with all these data privacy and data security issues. And then when we have that agreement, we could create a good uh, database nationwide. But I have to admit that already for some uh, uh, specific disease groups, we have developed quite good platforms and the database for specific purposes for the cancer registry, for in our hospital, for example, for hematology purposes, we have our own database, which is pretty comprehensive and provides the good uh, support uh, for the researchers, for the decision support uh, for doctors who need. But I would also like to add into, to all these um, uh, good things and the problem with electronic health records, uh, one issue that uh, we don't use at all the potential of, and that is the patient-reported uh, outcomes and patient-reported experience. We don't currently collect them. In our patient portal, unfortunately, patients and citizens don't have a possibility to add their information to it. And I think that is something what we certainly have to work with. And the third point that I would like to make here is this end user involvement in whatever you are developing in terms of digital world, because otherwise it is very difficult to convince the use. And then it doesn't make sense if it just exists somewhere, a nice platform, but nobody's using it. It has to bring the benefit. And at least one of the three benefits that uh, I think that the digital world certainly requires, either it saves your time, it uh, saves money, avoid duplication, for example, or it brings a better health outcome. And I think that's exactly the purpose of this type of data collection uh, and uh, good management of it and sharing it. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Nelia. Uh, and next, we'd like to move to uh, um, a more uh, a perspective from a member state. And uh, Dorian is going to give a, a view from the Slovenian member state perspective, please. So, first of all, I would like to thank you for the invitation for giving opportunity to think about uh, real world data and exp uh, expertise in our country. To be honest, there, are, there is a lot of databases in Slovenia. 
um, they have characteristics or registers um, either population epidemiological or clinical but more or less they are fragmented they are uh, located at clin clinics and they are more uh, uh, related to enthusiasm of uh, clinicians um, a very good example is the National Cancer Registry, which might be very soon um, upgraded into a clinical register. But on the other side, Ministry of Health um, did not yet decide about the vision uh, regarding our registers. Um, but on the other side, they are using those data uh, in yearly negotiation for new healthcare services. Uh, so in a way, um, we can say that the uh, importance of evidence-based decision-making process is precisely uh, defined uh, and contaminated by uh, political decisions. I would like to present now two examples which are in a way positive uh, uh, lessons learned. Uh, one is the um, breakthrough of a well-known professor when they, when they um, launch the platform for biological registry for rheumatological patient. Actually, they implemented international guidelines into national environment. Uh, the, the, on that platform, there is uh, data on patient treatment, visits, side effects, and so on and so on. What they, what they find out, they, inc they increased the outpatient uh, visits, they decreased hospitalization, they, they decreased the expenditure, and they improved the knowledge. Even more, uh, anonymous data are exchanged with other experts from other Nordic countries uh, and um, Spain, Portugal, Czech, and other republic. Another really uh, interesting example is so-called MedTech HTA project when they evaluated pacemakers uh, uh, in the uh, f five countries, uh, Austria, England, Germany, Italy, and Slovenia they find out that the huge discrepancy between health records from hospitals and the European Heart Rhythm Association was the uh, largest in Slovenia. Uh, with uh, additional uh, questionnaire, they find out that um, actually the coding system was uh, not updated. And based on those analysis, true world um, uh, evidence, they uh, they succeed in uh, upgrading the codes. So in a way, starting from nowadays uh, situation with two examples, I will, I will move to, to future. So through EU funds, we, we are launching central register of patient data with uh, data on um, uh, allergies, vaccination, blood type, hospital discharge, and uh, patient relatives uh, data free access of patient and they can allow a physician to access to that uh, platform. Not yet results, so I cannot share with you positive uh, uh, results, but anyway, uh, the expectations are uh, great in, in a way that we would like to include patient and um, increase uh, respons responsiveness, quality of healthcare provision and uh, in a way, increase savings uh, at the provider side. To conclude, let's say from Slovenian perspective, for CC uh, platform, we will opt for uh, to ex exchange database and developing epidemiological clinical registers. Let's say we can start with cardiovascular diseases, cancer, or um, diabetes, which are, for me, one of the main threats of healthcare system in CE region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dorian. Uh, and next, um, from one former health minister to another former health minister, to Miklos, if you can give a viewpoint from, in terms of implementation from a national health system perspective, particularly uh, the, the kind of a pan-European view as well, considering your, your involvement in various pan-European initiatives as well. You know, wherever, so, sorry. First of all, I would like to send a warm, warm welcome to the through the cyber space, uh, cyberspace of this webinar that is generated from our lecture room because I cannot greet you personally, but I, uh, but I would like to send a warm welcome. So the, you know, wherever we go in in Europe, whatever meeting we go in Europe, uh, the opportunity is provided by health data or digital health 
uh, in theory and in practice, uh, this seems to be a top priority on every meeting. And then the place is boiling, Europe is boiling for health data. And you know, in the last two or three years, uh, these various intelligent solutions are popping up and they are coming up in uh, with uh, lightning speed. And many other professionals, physicists, uh, astrologists, uh, they recognize that, uh, that there is a power in, in health data and they are changing directions. And, and instead of researching the universe, they started to research genome. And uh, you know, we, when we planned the implementation of the, of the national, uh, national e-health system in, back in 2011, we wanted to harness that uh, opportunity, that strategic opportunity. And that's why we made a, a joint national uh, data exchange platform. And, uh, and you know, the, simply the already existing large quantity of uh, clinical and administrative data could be used for saving lives and public money. Uh, and you know, this really offers uh, opportunity for uh, other secondary uh, purposes. Uh, as well. And, you know, we had these best practices before. Uh, we had systems planning, performance evaluation, patient safety, comparative analysis. So we did use the data, but not in its full potential. And, you know, uh, it basically it was uh, for management control and, and basic system planning. But, you know, when we changed this approach back in 2010 and 14, so we really institutionally started to use the data we had. And you do not necessarily have to think of some uh, data magic or black magic that we used. You know, simply by looking at the zip code of citizens and the and the interventions paid by the uh, paid by the health insurance fund, we could recognize that the cancer patient pathways are scattered in Hungary. And talking to the cancer surgeons, we recognized that, uh, through a comparative analysis that about 40% of the uh, of the liver metastasis patients are missing uh, from the uh, from the statistics so we centralized patient pathways and in two years we could increase liver metastasis operations in proper cancer centers uh, by more than 40 percent so simply the zip code and administrative uh, payment system data could help us saving lives and the uh, and we also used it for uh, saving public money that could be used for life-saving purposes. So we introduced joint national procurement simply because we were able to data mine the 48,000 contracts the Hungarian hospitals made and the 2.6 million bank transfers the hospitals made in a year. So we really cut the costs of pharmaceuticals, energy, and all other, uh, other areas. So I'm, I became a strong believer and a strong, uh, uh, strong supporter of secondary data use because I have the experience that even the most simple existing data can be used for uh, saving lives. Thank you very much, Miklos. Um, so next, for the next 30 minutes or so, we'd like to kind of open up um, a discussion with, uh, with everyone and also give everyone an opportunity who has joined the webinar to pose any questions as well. So if you do have any questions, please uh, go to the, 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 the questions bar and you'll be able to enter some questions which we can include into our discussion. Uh, and I should mention, if you are having any problems with your connection, you can switch both between uh, the, the uh, telephone and also the computer audio. Um, but just to begin, I think, you know, the, the title of this of this webinar was very much around uh, leapfrogging uh, legacy processes. And I'd like to initially get your view, and yeah, because you make a good point, Miklos, in terms of just using what you have. And is there a real opportunity that you see within Central and Eastern European countries where there could be a more systemic approach or there is an opportunity to leapfrog? Or is it, as you mentioned, Rafael, where there needs to be more kind of incremental innovation, basically, as such, and working towards that? kind of a common goal of such. So I'd like to open that up for everyone to start off with. Well, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, maybe I will start from one uh, point. Yes, I uh, really uh, in favor of step-by-step uh, -step strategy, as you mentioned and, uh, from my presentation. Uh, I know from my own experience in my own country that big reforms of healthcare systems are very long and very uh, money consuming processes. 
and bring uh, almost no effectiveness to patients. Only uh, next uh, <coughs> problems and generate more uh, and more demands from uh, patients uh, and entire society. Uh, however, when we will uh, focus on uh, detailed need and we start to work on this need, we will can we can. Uh, have a step-by-step -step strategy implemented. It is uh, well uh, uh, already uh, reflected in several European projects. And Dario, from your perspective, I guess the Estonian kind of example as such, where there's that kind of decision to have uh, a systemic approach as opposed to kind of perhaps as much incremental. What's been your you know, how would you agree with what Rafael's kind of saying, or has the Estonian approach been somewhat different? I think it's there are different things. There are things that happen at once, and you cannot do step by step. And then there are things that you have to prioritize and decide yes. what do you do first and what next. I, for example, I believe that um, things such as uh, digital prescription as we had nationwide, it was one step done. And in principle, the prescription as such is so well structured and formatted already for, I think, two centuries ago. It was very clear by every doctor and pharmacist what has to be on the prescription. The name of the patient, the age, the diagnose, the in active ingredients and the dosage how to, or the prescription, how to take the medicine. That was, I think, universal all over the world because otherwise you can go easily wrong. So there was not so much of structure needed in it, only to digitize. And that happens anyway, you know, the digital comes. But then when you go to the electronic health record, where doctors write, for example, in psychiatric hospital, they can write quite long stories using quite a lot of words, then to structure it and to make it somehow by the menu, drop down menu for the selection, that is not an easy thing. And that requires actually an agreement and it requires a change a little bit of habits, how we do things. And that perhaps is a bit different but from another hand, nowadays, according to my previous life data from the availability of uh, computers in GPs and in hospital offices, majority have computers. Most of the records are in computer. The question is only in which format they are, because if it is in the just a word text, there is very little difference and it doesn't help us to go to this next level of data analysis and data use and all these kind of things that we can do. It's just another, a little bit of text in the computer. But then when we could agree on this formatting and structuring, it could have a new quality. It's not the only quantity, it's also the quality that we cover. That is a step-by-step step, step, by step yes. approach for me. I would like just to thank because she was just uh, presenting what I would uh, comment on e prescription. Regarding um, electronic health record, I think that um, in this millennium in the healthcare system we did a great mistake. One of the biggest mistakes because we actually we excluded citizen or patient from the e health table. So they should be included. They should have the right to comment. Um, they are very well e-educated, and it might be that uh, uh, just interviewing them and following their needs, it might be easier to adapt us as a, uh, physicians to their needs and to standardize the format to, to, uh, to come closer to electronic health record. Nevertheless, let's say regarding prioritization, I think that first priority should, should be uh, to allocate the citizen in the center of healthcare system, then uh, all uh, changes are uh, easier and they will uh, be, uh, they will implement it smoothly. And, and what do you see are the good examples of that 
both citizen engagement, the patient engagement, what are the good examples of how that's occurred or what do you see that actually needs to happen in order to do that better or more effectively? So let's say in Slovenia we have only a few examples from let's say five or six years ago. Uh, actually more or less um, due to uh, political or economical uh, constraints more or less we are still on inputs and outputs. We still didn't tackle outcomes. And tackling outcomes uh, with PROMS, PREM, and so on, uh, we will be able to invite citizens uh, at the round table to discuss about. More or less, following uh, different reports or uh, WHO, OECD, if you will carefully be careful in reading, you will find out that more or less we are discussing about inputs, number of doctors, number of CT scans, and so on. Uh, there are only few data on the outcome of uh, healthcare delivery. Yeah, when, when, it is, when it is coming to the outcomes, you know, we, we have these proxies to outcomes. So if it is, if it is a, a, a prostate cancer patient, uh, whether after the intervention uh, you had to prescribe diapers to that patient, that means that most probably that patient suffered from incontinencia after the intervention. Or if uh, if some, uh, if, if Viagra was uh, prescribed, then most probably erectile disorder uh, was one of the unwanted outcomes of that operation. So the present administrative data can be used for this proxies and then we can further uh, research. In Hungary, what we did, uh, we involved the patient forum, the National Patient Forum, uh, for the design of the uh, of the eHealth system. And just recently, which was uh, five or six years uh, after the, uh, their involvement in the design of it, there was a there was a workshop at the French Institute. And you know, the uh, most supportive of secondary data use was the patient uh, forum itself. And you know, when Tanya mentioned that you have all these imaging databases, we're just working together with a Hungarian uh, physicist, a complex system physicist, who developed an algorithm that scored second on the National Cancer Institute's uh, deep learning contest uh, for uh, breast screening uh, diagnostics. Uh, and you know, when, we are, when I'm thinking about how can you reach back to a citizen for authorization for secondary use while, the, while there is an algorithm that emerged that if you can put all the breast screening images of the Estonian women through that algorithm, we might find some that was misdiagnosed positively or negatively. So, you know, but, but I also see that something for the secondary utilization of health data should not be an incremental change, but a big boom that we recognize that data is part of the medical process. So uh, dealing with data and dealing with authorization and dealing with patient consent issues for a long time, I think we should take a different approach to data. My, I also have a question around, is that approach consistent across Central and Eastern European countries? And you can say by extension across all of Europe, or, or how much is that varying based on your experiences within countries? And, and, and is there a way that we can kind of align that? What do you see as the vehicles yeah. to align that? It is culturally determined. The, the Dutch, they do not have curtains on their window. The Finns go to sauna naked. I don't know how the Estonians go to sauna. But, but you know, there are these various cultural attitudes. And, 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 and people had to live with uh, Gestapo, Stasi, KGB, all these uh, secret services. So there are different attitudes towards, uh, towards utilization of our health data. But I think we, sh we have to overcome it. We have to debate it. But we should recognize that, for example, Comparing the genome itself uh, is part of the medical process. It's not my uh, genome, but comparing genomes, that gives you the result what tumor to target or what status to target. So I think data should be treated somewhat differently as our privacy issues because it saves lives. Yeah, I also think that the data is, health data is a public good. Yeah. It uh, should be considered normal that your health data can be used for the research and for the uh, public health purposes. Uh, of course, it means that they have to be depersonalized to some extent so that they are, for example, if you use it for artificial intelligence, then you just need a huge database. You don't need a person. 
And I think that if people understand that with this approach they can get to the diagnosis or to the better treatment or whatever it is that improves their condition and their health outcomes, they understand it. But they are afraid that it comes out somewhere in the internet with the name, address and age, with all the diagnosis. And that is what we have to make sure that this will not happen because data is safe, it is used for the scientific purposes, and it will not be published somewhere in an open website. And that is the fear that we just have to handle and people have to be told that that is not the case in, uh, in the research purpose when we use them. And I think that uh, if well explained, then that is understandable, the, the need for these things. I think that the Estonians probably go to sauna naked and use the curtains. So we are... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, speaking about the, the, the benefits and the use of patient data, we have a, a question here. And the question is whether you have any thoughts around the possibility to recall patients by phenotype, perhaps, in a way that transitions towards more preemptive disease management or prevention model. Um, as a question by uh, Tony Bartlett, do you have any views around the use of patient data, particularly for preemptive disease management or prevention model? I just have to say that I think there is a big potential in it, because that goes to this group of real world data that uh, we have a lot, but we actually don't use. I think uh, the clinical trials, as they are right now, are focusing on uh, one disease, one treatment. The real life where people operate, in particular in the age group plus 50 plus, where there is more than one disease often or a medical condition or where people also in addition to what has been prescribed often purchase uh, over-the-counter medicines or also depending on their physical activity on where they live or what do they eat. That combination of all this information can give us much better picture of where this disease is going or how this is developing or how your risks can be handled uh, if we have the sufficient picture from your genetic information and then you add it to the phenotype. I think we could do much better in that sense, both the prevention and the treatment side. And do you see do you think patients see that value in that data? Because quite often, as we were talking about, that cultural challenge, the challenge of people willing to share the data. Or I think support. people are very willing to share all this kind of social data. What is much more concerned sometimes is actually doctors, because they believe that if all this information from patients comes suddenly, then GPs have to handle it right away. Like if I am collecting my blood pressure data, like two times a day, then my GP believes that she has to monitor regularly what my blood pressure is doing. Mm -hmm. And that is something what we also have to make sure that collecting this uh, patient input, adding to these uh, records, doesn't necessarily mean that doctor becomes 24-7 responsible. That is also the responsibility of a patient. So from, let's say, I will try to make my point of view based on my practice, let's say patient in my outpatient clinic, whenever they are suffering from some disease, they are willing to share their uh, data just uh, to be sure that uh, there might be some help. Uh, on the other side, I think that we physician, uh, we are too constrained to privacy uh, and leg legislative part of, of data, which in a way it's um, uh, avoiding uh, success of this process. I am data believer. Um, uh, unfortunately, we do not have um, uh, enough historical database to, to predict uh, some diseases of uh, a certain group or uh, uh, not only relatives, but a group of citizens of a certain region. So. Uh, we should uh, be much more carefully uh, listening to our patient uh, because they do not point out the privacy problems as the, the most important one. I think new care models will emerge on the data and on, on the phenotype type data as well in chronic conditions like diabetes or 
chronic cardiac uh, conditions. And you know, it, it will be predictive, prognostic, preventive. So it will support to keeping the balance in the life of patients. And yes, cloud will take a role in it. Uh, virtual teams will uh, take a role in it, and and patient doctor, patient assistant meetings will take a role in it. So this will be a huge depression, uh, uh, huge disruption. It will change the the professional relations inside the healthcare, the patient professional relations. So it will come, and it, it is emerging already. We are we are experimenting with the diabetes model in Hungary. Um, Along those lines, I mean, it, it doesn't sound like some of these challenges are all too different to any other region in, in, in Europe as such. So I guess my question is, how do you realize this from a Central Eastern European kind of perspective? We look on the Estonian example, but that, that was just a joke, but they are really a shining star. I have to say that I don't see much difference because from a year ago, I looked at like Europe-wide and there are good experiences everywhere. There are uh, difficulties which are pretty similar everywhere. And then if there is a passion and a desire and the, uh, somehow the agreement between the different parties to go forward, that is possible. Just one little example, there was a project that was funded before Horizon 2020 from Competitiveness and Innovation Programme that was aiming at making data available, health data making available for patients. And one of the partner countries, actually the coordinating country was Sweden and the Uppsala region that had a serious uh, fight between the patients and healthcare professionals about giving access for, of health data to patients. And the argument that doctors had mainly was that they don't understand so that is confusing and that makes life very complicated. Finally, they succeeded and in the end of the project it was clear that both sides actually won. They were happy, patients said that uh, they had, even when they found something serious or dramatic on that uh, website, they had time to prepare they went to see next time the doctor prepared with the questions. Otherwise, you may have this panic of uh, getting the news uh, and can't really have the uh, good conversation. But then they were prepared. They said, if we didn't know the word or if we didn't know the meaning, we asked friends or we found the, uh, somewhere somebody who knew. And that helped was beneficial for both sides. So I think that this type of agreement is necessary to take it forward. Okay, thank you. Um, this is just a reminder to everyone who's on the webinar, if you have any questions, then uh, please submit them into the, the, the question box. I, I want to move the conversation along a little bit because you touched on it towards the end around having an aligned vision, but there's evidently a need for, for there to be both collaboration and for there to be leadership in order to take a lot of these kind of data um, opportunities forward. And what is it that you've found based on your experiences before that's worked when it, when it comes to both, uh, when, when it comes to these things around uh, aligning on the vision, around how you collaborate with different stakeholders across different um, countries, uh, and, uh, and also where you find that leadership in order to kind of take things forward? If I may add here, I think you always have to have somebody who strongly believes in it and who has some facts and data to demonstrate that it works. Of course, it means that somebody somewhere has done the pilot and has done the experience, but it is very, very beneficial if you find this type of thing. Or somehow otherwise you can demonstrate one of these benefits that it saves time, money or gives a better outcome then you can be quite successful fast. Otherwise, you just have to go through this process of uh, going back forward and fail. And it's good, of course, if you fail in the beginning and then you succeed uh, faster. Otherwise, it's a long procedure. You know, I, I fully agree that the leadership is critical in this sense. And uh, there are, but there are some other issues. So this is not, not just a passive thing that that a government does a strategy and implements an e-health system or data exchange system, 
at the same time there is the marketing of the various solutions so uh, in Hungary we, in, in, in the past we fall into that uh, trap that the, that the implementation of the of the e health solutions was uh, provider driven and and that's uh, that that's not that's not good the government or the healthcare system should own the strategy and also uh, what happens around data and there are countries who are buying, buying up the genome or the genomic data of Central Asian countries and en mass. Uh, so there is a competition and there is a black market and there is a Wild West type of uh, of, uh, of data revolution going on. So this is uh, there is also a fight who controls data. And I think in the future question will not be that whether it is, it is the private or the public health insurance is more efficient and sustainable, but it will be the uh, control, at least the control uh, over the data and access to data. Because then if the data solutions are completely privatized, then we are ju just the licensed buyers like uh, the word processor software and there will be giants and there will be data slaves. And on the subject of control, actually, Tony Barton has just asked another question, which is, uh, it seems to be that there is an issue around control of existing resources, and is there a way to be able to liquidate, reorganize some of those resources um, in, in order to make the, the system as a whole more effective? And I, and I think particularly for you, Dejo, there's a question as to whether how much that's been considered within um, Estonia. Um, are these the kind type of barriers which you see that need to be uh, removed in order to kind of harness the, the use of patient data? Well, the resource is not the barrier. The resource is something that we are lacking. I think it's uh, the resource has so many meanings. I mean, it's the time that we have, it's the money that we have, it's people that we have, and I think that we don't have any of these enough. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I, I believe that this good data management can support saving in each of them so we can use the resource better that we have. We can avoid the duplication, we can uh, perhaps uh, skip some steps otherwise that we have done because we have learned from this uh, database that that is not necessary, that these procedures don't give us any added value, and we can somehow use this resource uh, better. I think that that would be beneficial for everybody with this aging chronic disease population in Europe as we are. You know, we did it in, we, we did use it in Hungary back in 2012. We completely re-engineered patient pathways. We closed up acute hospital care in 14 hospitals without a single demonstration and integrated 11 hospitals into larger ones without a demonstration. So just to give you one example, we closed up acute ophthalmology hospital beds in most of the places because most of ophthalmology is outpatient in Hungary and we use that money in many places for 24-hour outpatient emergency which is needed in community care. So we just reorganized patient pathways and reallocated um, budget between program areas because we did have a, a very accurate data mining on on the capacities and, and the activities that are going on. Yeah, I think that precisely ophthalmology and cataract procedure is one of the excellent examples when we're using data, we have been able to uh, reorganize the all spe speciality in, in Slovenia. Nowadays, 99% of operational performed in daily clinic, no more in, in hospitals. So a huge savings. Um, through through um, better data, through reorganization of, of pathways and reallocation of funds. So in a way, we take a lot of those three. Um, there are some other, other examples like cardiovascular diseases with um, national approach in prevention, promotion, um, starting with so-called forum of cardiovascular diseases. Slovenia example is one to be followed. When we engage actually all of Slovenian citizens being uh, tackled by cardiovascular diseases with a uh, yearly forum, launching a national strategy. And in seven years, we have been able to decrease the number of deaths per 1,400, 1,400. Half of them due to better organization, um, another center for cardiovascular diseases treatment, 
uh, five centers for cat lab and 700, half of them due to better prevention promotion. So using uh, excellent experience for Nordic countries, learning um, from them, uh, knowing our culture history, we have been able to implement our own path. So, so nowadays, uh, cardiovascular diseases are no, no more the main, main threat in Slovenia. So yeah, uh, avoiding borders, um, let knowledge to flow in, uh, but then use um, your historical uh, yeah, historical knowledge to, to and, and leadership and all other attribution to implement those solutions. I would like to give an example about an e-consultation that we have, yeah. where initially it was not so popular, but has demonstrated year after year, with the regular growth around 30% every year, that uh, sending data instead of a patient can be beneficial for all three partners. The so sender, who has, uh, is usually a general practitioner, who have said in their uh, feedback that actually they have learned quite a lot through this process. For example, from the case where the specialist just confirms that the uh, approach taken is right, or where they have done some corrections in the dosage, or they have recommended some tests, that the GPs say that they have really learned from this, then sometimes it has avoided a double visit to the patient because the specialist already can ask for some additional test before the visit or it has also affected well this kind of waiting queue, because if through this consultation the specialist would see that this is really urgent case, the patient can be invited in a few hours, few days. So everybody has benefited from this system and it has really demonstrated the value for each of the uh, partners in this. Yeah, I... <clears throat> I fully agree with you, and uh, I really admire the example from Estonia and uh, Slovenia. It's uh, really uh, beautiful examples for uh, me as a patient. But uh, for majority, I believe, uh, Central and European Eastern countries, we have a problem with uh, anti-data existence. When we discuss about data, you have to have data. So. The simple example from my country, okay, we have a national council registry uh, and we have a b biggest uh, data, uh, uh, patient database, it's a national health fund uh, database, but uh, what are the information are they collected? The, the information on where I were, uh, where I was uh, with my disease, what kind of uh, disease and how did it cost? End of story. No further data. Moreover, so uh, we need to build uh, uh, registries. We need uh, real health record function. This structure almost completely doesn't exist in our health system, or exists at a local, very local level, a local hospital. And this structure is completely di uh, different from other hospitals. Mm. I have a question to you. If your citizen uh, really implements the right that is given by the general data protection regulation, that you have a right to access your health data, then what are you given then? In which format? You, you go somewhere and you just see the papers or what is this process then? How it looks like? Uh, paper. Usually it's paper data, printed or even in handwriting, very old data. If, Regarding my own uh, cancer history, I saw my old very days from 20 years uh, years ago, written in paper because no did, there was no digitalization of this data. Yes, I understand those are kind of historical data, but uh, could it uh, be uh, digitalized, digitalized and uh, um, fulfill the demands of uh, kind of uh, historical data input? Yes, I believe, yes, it could be very informative. Uh, and uh, so, so this is the main point. We have to have data first. And so in Slovenia, patient is the, the owner of, of that, 
data so they can they can receive it uh, in any of format which are which is available but uh, regarding your your um, what you raised as a problem I fully agree with you unfortunately uh, majority or all, all European countries uh, developed defragmentated uh, IT system um, which was forced by those who are more powerful in a way in, in Central Eastern Europe, more or less uh, insurance companies. So we have a lot of data on uh, reimbursement, but a few of them are really uh, connected with the health status of citizens. So nowadays we are trying to uh, increase the, 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 the content of uh, patient data by adding National, health uh, National Public Health Institute and all other providers. And this is, was one of my, my points when, when I presented Slovenian case. Yeah, we have a lot of registers at the level of clini yeah. clinics, but they are not national, uh, impl nationally implemented. Not really so planned. few of them, like our uh, uh, cancer register, which is more than 50 years old, it's one of the, the oldest in Europe, it's not clinically uh, integrated. So there's a lot of data, but not enough powerful to uh, allow us to intervene much more effectively. So I'm passionate in, in, in seeing when there will be a connection of those local register and uh, upgrading to the national level. And here, I think that the ministry, the ministries of all countries, they will have to have clear vision how to do that. That is true that we have fragmented data sets and we have islands of research databases, uh, but sometimes those research databases cover 90% of the molecular pathological data of all the Hungarian pediatric hematology cases. But there you have to talk to a couple of uh, researchers and then you access a very nice database. And you know what? Uh, just two things. My understanding is that simply having the data with zip code and the location, and if you put it into patient history, what were the prescriptions over time? What was your patient history over time? Uh, you could develop very nice proxies uh, to outcome measures. So my understanding is that whatever data you have, raw, noisy, unstructured, you have to try to put it in action. And then the hunger for data will emerge. We are engaged in a data lake project. We are, we are doing it at the Page University. Uh, we are pouring together all sensor data, and MRI is a sensor in that sense, and research registry, whatever registry one researcher has. We are just combining all that data. Uh, we just go through the legal and methodological approaches, how to clean it, how to get rid of noise. And, and all this is focusing on how can you put existing data in action. It is more uh, more valuable than we think. I absolutely agree, Miklos. That is very important point that we don't need more data until we don't know what to do with the existing ones. And ergonomically collect until we do not know how to collect it ergonomically because doctors say get rid of administration. Okay, well, we just have a few more uh, minutes left. And uh, just to wrap up, and you probably already touched on it, I did want to ask everyone, uh, if there was something that you could change today, what would that be that would lead to better use of health data? And I think, Miklos, you just answered my question. But very quickly, if I could just go around everyone in, in about 15 seconds or so, if you can uh, give a viewpoint. The data chauvinism of the individual in, uh, institutions, because many times insurance believes that uh, their authority depends on owning the data, so they should give up data chauvinism uh, just to put to be to enable researchers and the system to put data in action. Danny? Well, what uh, Dorian said before, I think that. Uh, then we should look forward to the implementation of this uh, document that was published in April, the European Commission, the digital transformation of uh, health and care systems, because that is where they speak about European health record. Uh, a few uh, months ago, I, have a, I had the pleasure to uh, participate in uh, the workshop organized by EMA on uh, a common data model. And this is uh, the main, I believe, uh, direction we should all uh, go towards. Thank you. And Dorian? Okay, if I have to build a 
data healthcare system in one country on Europe, I will, I will opt for integrated national or European based uh, uniform uh, system. Okay, thank you very much. Um, in summary, there's, there's obviously there's evidence significant lessons that we can learn from Central Eastern European countries in terms of their approach to transforming health systems. And at the same time, you know, this question about being able to leapfrog health, legacy health systems is, uh, uh, is, is, has its own challenges as such as well. However, it's clear that, you know, there, there does need to end up being initiatives such as the IMI as one, as well as other kind of and European initiatives as well as local initiatives that are required which align on a vision which um, have both collaboration and leadership in order to uh, transform health systems uh, leverage then benefit the, the use of data and technology uh, and really improve patient outcomes um, ultimately so we look forward to, to seeing how some of these initiatives develop and uh, how initiatives within our, your respective countries also develop as well and I want to take this opportunity to thank you all for your perspectives today and to thank all of our listeners for, for joining today. If you want more information about the um, IMI BD4BO projects, then please visit the website, uh, which is www.bd4bo.eu. And with that, I'd like to thank you very much.